All right, we're going to get the GTAC Disaster and Emergency Preparedness Committee started. As I, uh, some of my favorite places say, uh, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here if you're uh, not here for the Disaster Committee. All right, good deal. Welcome. Welcome one and all to Austin. We're going to start first. Uh, my name is Eric Epley, and I'm uh, the chair for the Disaster Committee. Can everybody hear me okay? Am I doing a good job? I was in the back of the room and was frustrated because it didn't seem like the, we were utilizing the mics as well. Jory was doing a pretty good job, but I couldn't hear Ronnie. So um, all of us, we need to just be a little more deliberate about, I mean, I'm really up on this thing and I can hear myself. So that's probably the way, I mean, seriously, in the back of the room, it was unintelligible. So committee members, please. So quick uh, roll, let's see if we've got a quorum. So I am here and poking holes. Tim Berry. Here. Brad Gowdy. Here. Doug Haveron. Here. Wanda Helgeson. Here. Tom Hushin. Tom Hushin. Dr. Kidd. Actually, Dr. Kidd and Chief Kidd are currently running in the half marathon in San Antonio at the Rock and Roll Marathon where we have our 53-foot MMU set up, and I hope we don't see them. <laughs> okay. Robbie Kirk. Here. Frank Marshall. Here. Dr. Minson. Here. Dr. Moriber. Here. Sharon Knowles. Sharon is with family. Dr. Nimeth. Here. Ricky Reeves. Here. Denise Rose. Dr. McGraw, Here. Dave Taylor, Kenneth Webb. Here. I've got 13 out of 19. I think we have a quorum. In fact, we have a quorum. So, uh, Roll call, a couple of um, housekeeping issues associated with the call to order and roll call. Number one is uh, email list in your packet, uh, page three um, is the uh, current list of everybody that's on that. We separate out the at because that's the way we put it on the website and stuff so you don't get a bunch of spam robot things that apparently grab your email addresses. So we use that at to separate out. But you, we did that by domain. So if you're in the room and you see, well, here's our agency or our our domain, you can see anybody and everybody that's in your world, excuse me, from your agency that's signed up. Uh, this, this distro list, this GTAC disaster emergency preparedness list has 220 members now. It's probably one of the, we're, we, it's open to anyone and everyone. Um, I probably send more to it than just about anybody, but frankly, uh, I would be happy for us to, it's an open forum. It should be seen more as a a blog almost I mean, I, I, the some of you guys will send me articles and um, I'm gonna go on record as saying I clean those up when you send me something if we have some back and forth and I'll strip out all the headers and stuff the threads I don't do that for at, you know to take attribution away I just know that when I get an email and I have to go through two or three or four lines of that um, but I'd like to thank anybody and everybody who sent articles to me and then I forwarded to the group that I probably got intellectual property credit for figuring out so thank you guys for doing it. Dr. Nemeth is one of the better ones about it. He sends me a lot of the articles I have Ira found so <laughs> I thought I should publicly say that. Kelly Curry is another one. Where's Kelly at? There, there he is. Kelly's a good one as well. So you guys if you want to post them directly and you think they're germane to the group I have no problem with that. If you get in a bad habit of doing it and it's about you know your blender sales or something else you're doing then we'll knock you off the list. So if you want to send it for us to kind of vet, you're welcome to send those to my email address and I'll, I'll send them out, but it's likely um, just for the sake of uh, expediency on the emails, I'll trim those up. Um, minutes are on page nine. So uh, I'll entertain a motion to uh, accept the minutes. We use Ronnie's rules. So we can kind of do that at the end of this. This isn't a, technically a 
formal open records kind of an open uh, meetings act meeting oh i guess maybe it is we have to follow we have to actually approve those so moved, so moved in a second kenneth and doug any discussion about the minutes all right all in favor say aye, aye. any opposed so actually i don't think that may be the first time in the history of man we've ever actually approved anything in the disaster committee besides a big vote we wanted to go to gtac uh, that's a where are our DSA? Jane, are we supposed to do that every single time, approve them like yes. that? Yes. You're not required to have minutes. You're required to turn in a summary of your committee. You just happen to have minutes. so For reference? Have, yes, for reference. So if you have minutes, I think it's probably a good idea that your committee does review them and approve them. But Doesn't hurt to do it that way, but it also sounds like we don't have to. So all the minutes we've had before that were done on the Ronnie's rules of order versus the Robert's rules of order. All right. So we're going to work uh, fairly quickly through the agenda. We have lots of stuff to get through today. Um, and uh, we compressed some of the time. I got caught in a discussion that I got distracted on, honestly. Uh, honestly. Um, first is work group reports. 1A is steer. Um, Sharon Dawes is not here today. We will table that till the next meeting. We're going to clean up the agenda today as well. Uh, Texas Disaster Medical System, Dr. Kidd is running and being healthy, and Victor uh, is a large part of that as well. So we'll start off. Are you in a good place to tee up that EMTF discussion? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rick's here and the others are here. From, we'll talk about TDMS in a minute on the RMOC stuff. All Mr. Right. Wells. Thank you. Uh, we'll help you recover some time here. There you go. Brief EMTF, like this. Uh, thank you. All right. Recently, we had a real call. I've asked, been asked by a couple of people, was this just an exercise? And absolutely, it was not. We received a request, an EMAC request, to determine our availability for possible deployment to New Jersey. Uh, so it was a unique call down when we began to uh, work through the regions to say, can you send an ambulance with a crew for 10 days to New Jersey? It's about two and a half days to get there and two and a half days to get back and five days uh, of deployment work time while you were there. Although it was work on the coordinators and the uh, coordination centers to, to find the numbers, they found 50, uh, 49 trucks with nine strike team leaders that said, yes, we can go. Uh, so for those that are asking, was this just an exercise? Absolutely not. This was a for real request uh, for us to determine can we go, uh, although we were not selected in the end. So we were excited to see that because it was so far away, but yet we had solid uh, agreements to go. Next most important thing, our MOA is approved. It is in place. It was approved by the uh, EMTF Executive Governance Committee and is out, all of the regions have it. They are getting them signed for deployment. So we're very happy after a year and a half or so of work to say that our standard EMTF MOA that is standardized across the entire state is in play. So we're happy about that. Uh, just to tell you a little bit, the different MOAs that are, or the, the documents that are in place, the agreement is the piece between dishes and the lead rack. Uh, that is in place. The subagreement is the lead rack to provider, but more importantly for those to know that if you had or still have a DSHS to provider MOA in play and have had for a number of years, uh, they expired December the 31st. So to continue to be deployable, you'll need to sign an MOA with your lead rack. And the lead racks all have those and we'll be happy to visit with you about those. Whoop, two clicks. Bus has changed a little bit. This poster here, this is the most accurate representation of each of the buses as I know them. Uh, I've tried to rearrange the wording. Uh, hopefully before long we'll have real pictures of each of those buses. But the coolest thing is all 13 of the AM buses for Texas physically exist and are in Texas and all have decals on them. Over half of them are licensed. And the others are finishing up their licensing process to be operational. All 13 look like that today. Uh, four of them are on the conference floor that you can see while you're here. We've also developed a tool. Uh, it's a hot wash document that allows us to track the activity. 
Everything in this slide is a WebEOC uh, listing of AMBUS activities that have happened. And we're asking the AMBUS operators as soon as we get this published out to them that they will go back retrospectively and fill this in. We'll use it as a dashboard to document the activity of the AMBUSes. And we're actually looking at the other team components as well to use something like this as a method to determine how many training events have we done, how many actual deployments, and what type are they. The, dash, the entry form is relatively simple. It's simply fill in the blanks, and it helps those guys as they're deployed to know what questions they need to be asking, and they all will have access to this. This was designed and requested by the AMBUS work group, and it's been made operational now. On the conference floor, uh, we have the MMU set up. It is truly one team, and we're excited about that because we have parts and pieces from all the different EMTF regions represented. All eight regions are part of one team, so we have people from all eight regions work in the booth. We have equipment from all eight regions. You won't be able to see it when you go over there because it all looks the same. If you look really, really hard, you will see stickers and tags that these hanging bags may have come from Lubbock, where the stands came from Temple, the tent came from the valley, the trailer came from El Paso, and it is truly one team able to pull all of the parts and pieces together. And then we have two AM buses on display in the booth as well. Both are fire, dis uh, fire buses. We're excited to have our fire partners here uh, with us. So we have an AM bus from Houston and the San Antonio Fire AM bus in the display as well. So we're excited to continue to build those relationships. Hanging bags, we have a statewide adoption of the bags. You can see those, they're all hanging up. They're over there. Um, We've identified our 24-hour answering points for all eight regions. They've all been trained. The numbers are active and in play. And lastly, the uh, GTAC Disaster Committee asked me to put together a two-page document that kind of summarizes it. So I have the first draft of that ready to go to execs for review. And that's what I have. Questions for me? You know, for like six minutes, man, that is just a metric ton of work. That really, really is. So this is one of the larger crowds we've had. Victor, I want to say thank you to you and to all the, uh, all the EMTF coordinators in the room. <laughs> the coordinators are getting paid to do that. The task force leaders are not. If you're a task force leader in the room, raise your hand or stand up. Any yep. They're working, huh? OK, you guys are over here getting the applause. They're working. I get it. I understand. I'm picking. Thank you, Victor. That's great work. I want to bring up a couple of. Go ahead. I just have one question about the EMAC. Yep. Um, one. Did you get far enough in the EMAC request to discuss medical direction? Because the standard for EMAC medical direction when you move ambulances from state to state is that they're under the state medical director for the other state they're going to. There was a discussion and an assumption, so Eric may be better to answer that. Our, our discussion led to that the crews continued to work under their local medical direction, expecting that the EMAC allowed us to carry that across. That was our, you can help me and tell me if we told them right. So I, I think I'm relatively savvy on the EMAC stuff. I would give, I would give me a grade of 87, 88. But I, I'm positive the credentials in the compact allow reciprocity for medicine, for nursing, for paramedicine, allied health. I am reasonably sure within 90% that the medical director remains the medical director and the protocols remain the protocols for the paramedic. The weird part is when states do have an EMS medical director, um, it's an interesting question if the paramedic must then follow those protocols in the target state. And, and my sense is I don't know what, I don't believe that's accurate. So I'll, I'll tell you, I don't think that's true. Although it's a decent question because one of the problems we've had with EMAC and with uh, the FEMA deployments is we, didn't ha we don't have a state EMS medical director. I mean, Texas is a home rule, you know, so uh, I know that that has come up as to who they will be medically re responsible with, and that we've that's one of the reasons we created the Armoc medical directors was for that purpose. M my sense is that that doesn't 
change the fact that they are paramedics that still work underneath the license of a physician from home. The EMAC request doesn't mean I'm not a San Antonio fire paramedic anymore. Um, I think I would have to work under the medical authority up there about that gives you that gives you the ability from a state law up there about why I can practice. R right? In other words, you're under the medical command and control, if you will. Because otherwise, ambulances are just coming into town and they don't have any way to kick an ambulance out. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, it's, it's not that we want to have this guy be a new, have the medics working underneath um, new protocols, which would cause me all kinds of angst, both, both uh, for all kinds of reasons. But more in line with, as a state, as a sovereign state, if you send somebody a bunch of trucks, they're working for me, okay? Well, working for me means I get to kick them out or send them home if we don't like them, if they do something we don't like. That they have the authority in our state now, deemed status to work here, sort of like we do with the state peripheral, you know, when we have um, ambulances that come in from just across the border of any part of our state. I think that's what it's more in line of when we talk about those state medical director issues, those have come up. Um, I think that anybody in the room who's more EMAC savvy than I am is welcome to, to contradict what I said. Dr. Minson? Some other, states, some other states do and have in their EMACs actually spelled that out. So there actually is a model. And this is not for Texas, but I'm just saying for those other states which usually have a state medical director, there's a transitional issue that says that that individual in the incoming state will have that, you can repeat it, that the, that the, that the incoming state actually has supervision and direction responsibilities with regard to those paramedics so that home disseminating medical directors are not necessarily responsible for an out-of-region out of activity. I don't know that we've got that addressed. So the EMAC basically said that some of the states when they request those assets, and we need to walk through EMAC first, but when the state requests those assets that it's very specific in there that they will be under the control, command, authority, direction of that state EMS medical director and that's stipulated. I read the Rec A, so, so let, this is a perfect time to brief it up. EMAC, the way it works, is uh, a little bit like um, shift bids. <laughs> it's not exactly. Maybe not. It's, so EMAC is a system that's been put together by the states through uh, NEMA, the National Emergency Management Agency, which is sort of a professional organization for all the state EMS, I mean state emergency management directors. The interesting part about FEMA is if you get FEMA assets of a state that has needs and they go to FEMA, FEMA pays potentially 100% of that. An EMAC request is state to state. So I'm the state of Eric and I'm asking the state of, you know, Christine to give me something. Then FEMA will pay 75% of her cost. I, as the requesting state, am responsible for 25% of her costs. So it's in my interest as a state to find the lowest bid. Does that make sense? I have a fiscal opportunity <laughs> to find the lowest guy. But I also know operationally how long it's going to take them to get there, that kind of stuff. EMAC started on the East Coast where states kind of look like our racks, right? I mean, no, really. I mean, this is like us going to Austin or going up to Temple to help them. That, those are state deployment. Those are interstate deployments at that point. We go all up, we can drive 12, 15 hours and not be out of our state, so we don't really think much about EMAC. But if you have states that literally you can drive 100 miles and be in another state, they had to have some state to state process, and that's really where EMAC came from, as I understand it. It's grown into something much larger. <clears throat> that bid for R, that RF, I mean, it's not an RFP, it's called a REC, a request A, a REC A form, goes to kind of an email list server, if you will. And that REC A says, we need 25 ambulances from member states. Everybody send us what your costs would be, how quick you can be there, et cetera. And so there's some stipulations. This is not less than five days or whatever the requirement was. That's what went out. Texas picked up on that REC A and sent it out. There were at least two other REC A's for ambulances that went out before the one you guys saw. Okay, 
So as a state, we have to decide what our risk is in participating and routing that through our emergency management structure, which is through the SMOC and ultimately through the SOC, through the State Operations Center, back to the EMAC process. You stop me if I'm wrong, Rick. But we're one of, essentially one of 50. If everybody answered it, there would be 50 opportunities, and they would pick based on, they may pay more if they're quicker. They may pay less, but it takes them longer to get there. Hey, they could pay more and wait on us. I don't know. We, I, don't know I don't know what the other prices were, right? It's a, it's a silent auction. I think, it would be, I think it would be helpful, though, to follow that rabbit trail of credentialing um, as it talks about deployment with an EMAC request and the EMTF. You're going to have nuances that are different for the paramedics responding on an AMBUS and an ambulance versus your nurse strike teams and those types of things later. Um, th those physician licensure, nursing licensure, um, those are going to be more complicated and, and they vary by state. So if, if I, I think the, the Rec A request from New Jersey does give us a great opportunity to say, let's take that now and play it out as if we would have deployed all components yeah. of the EMTF. Let's we, play it out and we're, yeah. find our gaps in, in the legal concerns that you have, because I know they, they certainly exist in EMAC requests. We, um, we just recently did a drill with 22 states on EMAC requests for nurses, and it, it exploded. So um, it, it's an interesting thing that I think you should at least take the opportunity to walk through now that you've had it. We, we need to do that on the paramedic side especially. It actually becomes, oddly enough, easier for the MMU because the, the compact sta stipulates that a, a physician or nurses working for a, like it's a fixed location, we're setting up a field hospital, there's a doctor in there that's going to be the medical director for that operation. The paramedic piece that has um, delegated authority from a physician who may be 1,300 miles away is a, is a softer, we needs to be explored. So, Victor, we'll spend some time with EMAC SMEs somewhere. And we'll, we, we, let's see if we can report back out on the next briefing on EMAC uh, certification, uh, credentialing. And really, it's more about authority. Me, the credentialing piece is less cumbersome, I think, but we need to, it, it's all of that. We'll, Eric. Yeah. As a follow-up to that, where will that be done? This committee, EMTF, TDMS, where are we assigning the follow-up to this? Well, Victor, works. I know we're... <laughs> I'm assi Victor's going to bring that back to this discussion in February. And I bet you you'll hear it somewhere else before then. There's a lot. There is some swim lane overlap in all this. But the GTAC Disaster and Emergency Preparedness Committee for EMS and Hospital Issues isn't going to, I mean, when you see all of the things that have come out, guys, I mean, and after Rita Katrina, we were meeting monthly for eight hours. Why was that? Because we were kind of it with respect to health, with acute care planning for disaster preparedness. Remember that? We'd meet at THA with a big red, giant, bright red rug, right? We met f for hours with our DSHS colleagues and developed, you know, out of that has stemmed TDMS, the Texas Disaster Medical System, which DHS, DSHS is off and running with now. Emergency, uh, the Emergency Medical Task Force concept. I mean, all of those things have spun out of this group. I mean, I don't, we don't say this a lot, but that's the fact. The Amulet Staging Manager class, medical incident support teams, what we called forward coordinating elements initially, all of that's come out of this body and now has its own kind of thought processes and governance and that kind of stuff. That's great, but th we, we shouldn't forget that this group has done a lot and at the end of the day, we're gonna come up with more, right? I'm dying to come up with the next problems and start fixing new new groups and new problems as well. So Victor, if you would, I bet we have more, we'll be sick of it by February. We'll have the answers, but we need to close the loop because we'll know the answers. Everybody in the room will go, yeah, we talked about that three times in all the other meetings. But perfect opportunity to bring it up. Thank you. Um, the other piece I thought was interesting was the MOA that we decided to use for this. We're still in the hybrid, we're sort of transitioning from the, the old DSHS state to provider 
MOA, which expires on December 31st or, right, so we'll get there. And the other MOA, which is now between the lead racks and the providers, which we're getting signed as fast as we can. So for anybody in the room who was called up, we chose to go with the old DSHS MOA because it looked like the largest percentage had that still in place, and we would rather just go with that for this one-off EMAC request than to try to find all people who were, had it in the pipeline, it was in their city legal, but oh, you can't go on this job, but somebody else who had signed it, it seemed a little disingenuous, so we chose to use the old MOA because it's the, hopefully it's the last time we ever have to use it, and we didn't even have to use it. Um, I want to get to the MOA thing, but it just brought me up one more thing. EMAC is also sometimes utilized politically. So, so I, I promise you that sometimes people have to make EMAC requests to demonstrate that there's no clear avenue except to utilize FEMA assets. Is everybody tracking what I'm saying? That, that may, I don't know this, this is conjecture. I don't have any basis in, in fact to say what I'm gonna say, but it's clearly not gonna stop me now. <laughs> It's entirely possible, you can, I can create a scenario in my mind that I've been a part of where you're having to justify to FEMA headquarters why we're leaving the FEMA ambulance contract turned on and what have you done as a state to try to get other assets into play and putting out a FEMA Rec A, I mean an EMAC Rec A to try to get 25 ambulances would be one of the things that you could foreseeably see somebody doing to, to create a paper trail to say, well, we've got a bunch of FEMA ambulances here, but their contract ends, it's usually, a, I think, a 14-day deployment, right? Does anybody have uh, intimate knowledge of the activation? I think it says uh, it's 14. And that rec A came out on day 11. That's Right, which I think was the 11th day of the, 11th or 12th day of the, <laughs> right? So you, you can sort of imagine if they couldn't get all the EMAC ambulances in, they'd have to leave the FEMA contract on. Now, I don't know if that's what happened, but, you know, we've been a part of some conversations where we were arguing every single day at 10 o'clock with D.C. trying to keep the FEMA contract on to relocate all the people back to the East Texas, you know, Houston, East Texas area from Ike. I, so those conversations were... I guarantee you, ongoing in those multi-states. Um, Christine, go ahead. So there seems to be a little bit, Christine Reeves, Hot Rack. Um, there seems to be a little confusion on the MOA. So I've been in the MTF meetings and these meetings and we've all been planning for December 31st and a, e a letter was gonna go out from DSHS regulatory somewhere the end of November-ish. Um, in yesterday's EMS meeting, and I've been looking for Maxie and he's not here, but he announced that the letters would probably be still be going out the end of November, but they wouldn't expire until March or even up to six months after they sent the letter out. And so a lot of EMS providers that I myself as a rack have been working with heard that and they're like, <clears throat> you told us December 31st, Maxie's telling us a different date, so I just... I need some clarification from somewhere so I know what to tell everybody. What does the contract say? Does anybody? What's the actual MOA say? I mean, the DSA it says it expires MOA. on December 31st, and I don't know how you it doesn't. That. The MOA doesn't say that. It's so, sort of an evergreen. Uh, if I would bet it has evergreen language ish uh, and five or Rick. The, term, the termination letter was supposed to go out at the end of October. So, in essence, you, it, the MOA is a 60-day cancellation clause. Um, I believe that that's true. It should have gone out the 1st of November, to, so it termed on December 31st. Yeah. Why it did not go out, I do not know. But it has not still gone out. But So we may have to change the term date, but it's not going to be March. I don't no, it'll be 60 days from, from the date of notice. Letter out. 60 and days so of the notice. May be, may December, March, maybe January. January 15th or something like that. Right, right, right. So, so I think this is, uh, 
it's an unfortunate misstep with respect to communication, but it's not. I mean, so pick it, right? So it's, it's January 15th, it's March 31st, it's June 1st. I don't, you know, our path, I think, forward is to move the lead rack MOAs, and we need to be moving smartly towards that. Um, I don't like any time we misstep with information. I, I get what we're saying is racks, and then the providers go, you don't even know what you're talking about. Are you even going to these meetings? Were you drunk? I mean, th that's kind of the problem. But the way I answer that is this is what they said. It's DSHS. I mean, that's actually kind of an answer, and everybody usually goes, okay, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Get it. Right? I mean, it's not, it's not a lick. It's a huge, there's seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 people. It's a lot of moving parts. Letters don't go out. No big deal. I, mean, I don't think anybody expects that. I, don't, I certainly don't expect it to go smoothly every time we end a big contract like that. So. <laughs> You're allowed to say that. <laughs> so expect it soon then is what you're saying right <laughs> so um, anybody else have any thoughts or concerns about that I think it's a it's something we need to get resolved and get the letter out but it's a non I mean it's a non issue from my from we'll, we'll not, we won't remember this conversation as opposed to Victor doing the AAR and stuff by the way the AAR if you guys didn't notice that the AMBUS working group is rocking. That group is doing a great deal of work and has already done a bunch of work. They're learning from each other. They're meeting, is that monthly? They're bringing their people in and having a big round table for five, six hours, and they have not left early yet. I mean, they have filled that time every single time. And uh, in a lot of ways, it feels a little bit like this when we were a task force, kind of the same uh, operational conversations that was kind of, that's kind of exciting to, to be a part of that. The AAR tracking is also giving us data with respect to every single AMBUS deployment. If they go on a local job to a fire, they're putting that data in. We'll be able to say the AMBUS is in the state did this many jobs this year. Well, if we don't have any hurricanes, people think they're just sitting there, and that's just simply not the case. So they recognize there's value in tracking and showing what they're doing, and I think it's, it's really it's a great thing. So, Victor, that's thanks a lot. Also, the consistency with the bags and other things you talked about, huge towards sending multiple teams, multiple pieces of equipment from around, and we're doing a great job of uh, of the consistency being better and better every time. One team. Brad. Do we have anything? Microphone. Figured I people usually don't have a problem hearing me, but. Do we have anything, or can Victor provide us with a summation or PowerPoint that we can take out to our local region to edu educate the providers on? You can have that yeah. one for sure, because it's on Reagan's computer. <laughs> Do you have something you want to, uh, that would well, be better? I was just thinking on the fly, we also have the, uh, that uh, video that kind of explains EMTF mm -hmm. that's out there. We've got a couple of video tools that, that we can help point you to just so that people can be aware of it and that we can do stuff more specific. That two-pager that I wrote is kind of a summation as well uh, that we just need to get those pushed out, so yes. Okay. So by the end of next week, which is a good work week, right? Is Thanksgiving next week? Yep. Yes. yes. Next Thursday? Yep. Thursday after. By the end of next Friday, well, we've got it. By the end of next Friday, on the GTAC list server, you will get we, and I need them to pay attention so that we can get it done, because we means you mean Reagan. not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make sure we are listening. <laughs> we are going to send out the two-page the two PDF document, the links to the video stuff, and maybe a link, a download from a Dropbox or something for what you're talking about, a, a PowerPoint. That'd be great. Would that be helpful? Okay. Enough of that. MMU typing. Are we done with that typing document? Has that been blessed by governance? MMU typing document? Okay. Do we need to keep that? I'd like to keep the EMTF report on the agenda. Does everybody agree? Yeah. Committee? Um, I think we can uh, take the MMU typing off. That document's done. I mean, it's done as much as anything's done. Um, the RMOX is next. 
Do you, did, do you want to wait until we have a firmer decision from some of the recent TDMS? Okay. So we'll table that and leave it on. Uh, governance structure report. The governance structure, that was left on there from an old agenda item. And you kind of covered any of the things in here from governance that we need to talk about. The MOA has been covered. Um, the update on the status, all that other stuff has been covered. I don't think there's anything from governance. I'd like to leave EMTF governance report and take structure out of that. AMBUS working group report, we just kind of briefed up all their AER stuff. So Victor, I think you're kind of doing a good job. I want to leave these items there so that if we want Chief to come talk about something with the AMBUS, it's there. It's a placeholder. EMTF coordination center standards. Did we put a hard document together, Victor? Has EMTF, have the coordinators talked about a hard requirements document? Um, been firmed up as something solid so I'm gonna there are a few of us uh, more than a few who this will resonate with but so Kelly me Doug Chris Carlson Frank right there was a group of us at THA Ricky you may have been in that room where we talked about what the, the we called them regional EMS coordination centers or something back then we had a whole matrix of what they would do versus the state versus whatever it was pre or sort of combined with our mock discussions. It was not, we didn't have EMTF. And so I think the EMTF coordination centers have in some ways become that. Um, and so I think one of the problems we had with the other discussion was um, what regions they would cover and those kinds of things. So it's probably one of those ideas that was great that we put in a drawer somewhere and it's popped back out with the EMTF coordination center. <coughs> If you guys would take a task, or it doesn't have to be for February, but put on your list of things to start working on is, what are those, how do you pick a call center? What are the requirements you're going to want out of them to, you know, 24-7 number? You know, who know? Who knew? We have those. The 24-7's all identified. They're all operational now. We need to tie that into our original concept of the coordination. Center. It probably has more to do with the operational component. So it's the AMOPS thing that Houston's doing. It's how do we work at a local slash regional slash state activation level and where are those guidelines and standards and how do they work? Right. So almost like SOGS or something as opposed to um, do you have to have a 24-7? I mean, that's sort of obvious at this point, but where do you point to? Someone says, well, I want to do that out of my office. <laughs> well, you can't do that. Well, who says I can't do that? We, we have a phone number and everything. It's like, well, that's because we put together what the requirements were, and we've got some of that floating around in about six different locations, so that's another, as we're cleaning up our world, right, um, we've gotten the big pieces out of the way. We have MMUs that are staffed. We have AM buses that can roll down the road. We have ambulance strike teams and strike team leaders. We're just, it's the next level of stuff in the rabbit hole. Um, and I think the EMTF Coordination Center standards and operational guidelines is a great um, next step. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, um, we'll leave that on the agenda and start talking about it regularly. EMTF Ambulance MOA, we covered that. Disaster Medical Care Scarce Resources, Dr. Moreover, there you are. Yeah, yep. And just so I can keep up with our track, we're here, we're here, we are here until noon. Okay, I got 11.23. Anybody got anything different? man with two watches doesn't know what time it is okay
While we're um, getting ready, I'm going to uh, table a couple more things while they're doing it, just real quickly. We're not going to talk about the ESR VIP thing today. Kelly Adams, are you? she's not here, is she? So we're not going to talk about that. We're going to table that for another moment. There's some other movement, and I'd like to wait on that. Similarly, um, until Chief's kid, Chief Kid is here with me, I'd like to uh, table the Emergency Management First Responder Council and TMAC um, discussion. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the text frack, uh, first responder authentication credential, the uh, um, smart card, statewide smart card effort that um, there's a pilot project underway. Um, we'll talk about that at the end, perhaps. We'll table number uh, seven, no, yeah, seven, the tracking and spending costs for hospitals that uh, Jory's always wanted us to keep in mind, and uh, Denise. Um, then we'll work on prioritize next steps. I am going to want to talk about the meeting schedule in a second, so people in the audience and committee members, um, I'm going to want to make sure we have some conversation about uh, meeting schedules and stuff. I know that went on in trauma. How many people were in trauma systems? It was a pretty good discussion, right? Okay. We're going to have it here, too, in just a second, because I think it's important. Dr. Morber? We've had a lot of discussions now over many of the aspects that are concerned with the uh, pan flu, uh, as you know, dishes and uh, uh, the Department of, Home, of uh, Homeland Security and Health and Human Services feel this is probably the most likely and most lethal of all events that may befall this country, as probably with the exception of the EMP. Um, that being said, as you know, we have to have good surveillance of what we are looking at as far as what we're looking at as far as surveillance is human to human transmission. So based on the U pandemic influ influenza uh, phases, we're looking at phase four. We're not looking at something like H3N2 in Iowa where they caught it from the cattle or pigs or whatever, but we're looking at the actual uh, uh, transmission human to human. And what we're looking at is preventing pandemic. What they're discussing is a, is a targeted layer containment strategy, which includes surveillance, early detection, treatment with antiviral medications, the use of infection control measures that prevent transmission, that would be closing schools, social distancing, et cetera, and vaccination. And what we're trying to do is move that bell-shaped curve as far as we can to the right to allow sufficient time to develop a vaccine. So what we're discussing now is a timeline, and we're first beginning to talk about this, and this will cover all the aspects that we've been talking about, pan flu. So we're, it, it was a little tedious to try and get this on there, but if you look over to the left, first there's syndromic surveillance, and situational awareness, which is what's going on now to make sure that whatever is popping up is not dealing with human-to-human -human transmission. Now, the Institute of Medicine has decided there are three standards. Uh, uh, among them are conventional, contingency, and crisis. They don't really uniformly fit with what we look at triage levels for pan flu, which is level one, which is surging, level two is at capacity. When I say at capacity, all beds and all ventilators are full, and level three are over capacity. That's the oh my God situation we hope we never get to. So what we're trying to fit in here is what happens with conventional standards. For example, with EMS, it would be 911 as usual. But as we start to see surge, then we have to initiate our contingency standards. And how do we get, how, what do we do with our services? For example, 911 calls, 311 calls, we to, uh, advise people to stay home, uh, to go to the primary care physician, or do we transport them and then refer them back to the 911 system? And this would be, uh, in a lot of cases, would be, it would be based on run, uh, run volume, call volume, and whether hospitals and ICUs are filled or not. As we continue on, we get to level two, we're already at capacity. So at that, that point, we're looking at crisis standards, somewhere between the initiation of level one and the initiation of level two. And crisis standards would include those things that we do in the hospitals as far as ventilatory support, and also things that may be considered for EMS. And that would be maybe no, uh, no dispatch or dispatch care, transport for, versus no transport. And then going on to allocation of resources, are we coming, are we not coming? And as we continue on, as you can see, many aspects fall in here. Some of them include communication standards. So we, do, we have standard communications, which we're doing for influenza now, and as opposed to a pan flu situation. And when do we decide to change this? When do we become a modal communication system? whereby we have specific phrases that we're, we're sending out at specific times. And these would also start with the contingency standards and, at, and prior to or at the initiation of our surge with double one triage. 
And then we would go on with public information for prevention, protection, and procedures. When this uh, affects one community, it may be strictly local. Two communities, maybe we need to set up a jurisdictional incident uh, uh, communication center. Uh, and, and these would be decided also on a local level and move up to the state. And in doing this, we also consider what we call informed consent, which what we're calling now is um, medical understanding for sustainable treatment. And when do we start to go into this phase and start to have informed consent when patients come into the hospitals and we're at maximum surge. And also force protection, the same way we're looking at not only our healthcare individuals, but also those that supply our lights, our electric, uh, our sewage, all the daily needs of society. And this is what we're starting to talk on. We're gonna have a meeting on the 18th of January to continue this. And we're gonna mark out the trigger points that we would really consider at what point we start to phase this in. So, so uh, a couple things. Um, first is, uh, I wanna thank you for all the work you've done with this. This has been a tireless, this has been a uh, incredible uh, demonstration of uh, tenacity, if nothing else, Dr. Morber. Um, first, you know, the inconsistent or sort of phased migration we saw with H H1N1 where it didn't hit kind of like I think we've always had the plan, right? Where it would all kind of happen at once to everybody at the same time, didn't come to play. And I think that's created a false sense of comfort, um, number one. And uh, second of all, um, the emergency management engagement. Um, it's been pretty clear just with some of the stuff with uh, um, the, yeah, the um, no, the mosquito stuff. Um, spray. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to think of the spraying, but the technical word for spraying, but spraying and stuff. So West Nile virus issues related to deployment of assets and resources. And the emergency powers from the public health emergency declaration, um, the integration of NIM were here, he would talk a lot about making sure that we're finding ways to be linked um, and integrated with our emergency management partners because you talked about healthcare workers, but we also talk about the guys who keep the grocery store and the truck drivers and the gas station attendants and all, you know, all of those things that keep society actually moving. Um, and I think that we tend to have the healthcare focus with healthcare workers and those people. And sometimes we don't think up, we don't think up another level of the uh, upside down wedding cake, right? It's the next piece that we may, that the best people we could vaccinate are the food workers maybe, or the gas station attendants. I mean, I think that's one of the things we have to engage our uh, non-medical partners with and have them in, and I think we're doing a good job of that. Um, that's actually all I want to say. Uh, I'll open it to the committee. Any questions about that or any of the work? There are uh, some questions I have as well about uh, the other work that some of the other areas are doing. And at the next committee, I, next meeting in February, do you think we'll have a report out for where we're headed with an integrated, okay, I, that was, cryptic enough to some of us that we could get there. Thank you, Dr. Morber. Any questions from the audience on that? Okay. Um, so let me manage my time better than I normally do. We have 30 minutes. I want to leave 10 minutes, maybe 12 minutes for uh, the discussion on the meeting stuff. Um, Maggie's going to talk about EMP real quickly. Kelly, do we need to brief anything on this? I'm looking. I had a TDMS training report. Can we go? <laughs> Sorry. Sure, sorry. Uh, two things, I defer my time to Victor Wells on the training piece and he'll explain why staff is now providing leadership for that subcommittee, but he still serves on that, so I'll defer that to him. But I would remind you that we have mass fatality that I'll give you two minutes on. At the end, we need to do that, uh, perfect. TDMS Education Subcommittee, we met uh, during TDMS. We, are, we pretty much have the four programs that we rolled out last year during the EM conference ready to be pushed out. We'll be bringing on instructors who can teach that at a local basis. Uh, so we've got the documents finalized or the presentations are ready. We're building the packages now so that those, those can be disseminated. So that's where we are with that. We've held off on trying to turn that into a online class at the same time. We want to get them rolled out so they can do face-to-face -face training and then we'll follow that with online. That's where we are. Okay. Any questions on that from the committee? Okay, so uh, let me do a little bit better job with this now. So Maggie, f is five minutes enough to yeah. terrify us? Yeah. <laughs> so get that microphone good and close so people in the back can be similarly scared. 
I'm not trying to terrify anyone. Um, what I want to do is introduce a concept that I don't think, Eric, you were talking about earlier, thinking outside the box. In Texas, we see tornadoes, we see hurricanes, so it's easy to think we have to expend a lot of energy to try and prepare for this, and we do. And what I would like to sort of bring to the table and get some discussion going on, because if you don't discuss it, you never really actually come up with any answers, or you don't get the right people in the forum to discuss. I'm not a physicist, I'm just a dumb little old, old ER doctor, but I want to get us thinking outside of the box. There is a lot of information out there that some of the terrorist states are trying to build nuclear bombs. There's also a lot of information out there from the physicists that it would take one nuclear bomb 200 miles up over the United States to reach coast to coast and border to border. If we lost our electrical grid, there would be no salvaging any of those people on ventilators. There would be no salvaging people driving trucks to bring us food, water, everything that we get up in the morning and think it's going to be there. And I would direct your attention to the East Coast who still has no electricity after what, seven, eight days, or however long it's been. It's been a long time, and there are people dying back there. This isn't, I'm not, I'm not here to preach about what we need to do, but what I'd like to do is get the right people at the table to talk about this. There has been legislation, even in Washington, that's been introduced and then tabled because no one knows what to do. No one wants to think about what if we lose our power. I've read a little bit about the transmission of power in the United States, and there's actually three transmission corridors. Texas is one. And yeah. Then the rest. There's a West Coast and an East Coast. Okay. So we have the ability to generate our own power in our own state. I know, even you, Dr. Minson, in that rat's nest that's called Washington, that there's got to be people there that could come and give us some information about ways to mitigate a horrible event that if you read any of the sort of the intelligence community stuff, and I'm not talking about anything that's hidden, I'm talking about stuff that you can go on, on the internet and look up, that this is what they're worried about. They're worried about, pardon me? Stay closer. Oh, sorry. If you can go on to the internet and look this up for yourself, this is what the intelligence community people, and I'm not talking about anything that's hidden, they talk about this in a bunch of forums that they're worried about a nuclear weapon. That doesn't mean it has to be dropped on the soil. So I would like to get some people who are interested in this to discuss it. We, Eric mentioned thinking more than just what we get focused on for a disaster preparation committee. My experience tells me if I can take care of the sickest patient, I can take care of everybody else. So anyway, that's my, my bid to try and get some thinkers to the table. There's a lot of smart people in Texas. I'm, I'm interested in talking to them to get their ideas and see if anybody is worried about this like I am. I know several people I'm associated are worried about it. And let's maybe think of ways to mitigate this that don't cost an arm and a leg. At least let's bring it up for discussion and if nobody's worried about it, so be it. So, so if you guys don't realize this, they, this isn't new. They knew about EMP and electromagnetic pulse from a nuclear device when they did the first tests of nuclear devices with uh, Los Alamos I mean, this is not new. They just never really worried about the EMP, about knocking out the power, because they were blowing it up, right? If you, if you drop a weapon on a town, the EMP part was kind of uh, extra. So, so this is not, this is well documented. It is fact. If you saw Ocean's Eleven, that was kind of the idea from a small device when he set that thing off in the van and 
sort of the power went out. That was a not very well done one. I mean, it was a show. But the movie Revolution, or the show Revolution right now, where the power is kind of off, it does bring us back to uh, kind of the caveman. I mean, it really does change. When we think about every bit of our power in our, in our society goes away and could be gone for, I mean, ever. I mean, that, those, until you rebuild things. One of the simple things is burying communications equipment, burying, burying ham radios. We say, well, how am I going to bury those? Well, I mean, in a basement of a building that's protected that can't be affected by the EMP. I mean, the military bases, if you don't know it, all, most military bases have a pretty extensive tunnel system, right? I mean, so that's not unheard of um, to store things there. We need to explore those kinds of opportunities to put things in places that might be shielded. I'm going to turn this to Dr. Minson. We're going to go into your ESF-9, same thing, Matt, okay. if you don't mind. Sure. Can you hear better now? Yes. It's a new mic? Okay. So I, I would echo that exactly. Uh, there are a lot of issues that have been discussed. Last week there was a uh, sanitized briefing um, by CIA, um, open source material type discussion about where they thought the prioritization of threats would be. Uh, they did mention this issue. They also mentioned a contaminated environment issue secondary to radiological stuff. And so, um, almost concurrent with that, there's been a directive through the ESF-9 channels, that's the search and rescue channels, which is what we do with Texas Task Force One. And over the next three years, we're going to be actually doing functional exercises at Disaster City. Uh, the first one is coming up at the end of April. I I'm of a belief that we can't really do the rescue of individuals from this contaminated environment in this novel capacity without actually having a handoff of patients. The commonality in every single disaster is what? People get hurt or people are injured or ill, and we need to have some sort of capacity for that. We do not do definitive care. We don't even really do stabilizing care for victims with, the, with search and rescue. We hand them off as quickly as possible. That said, for us to train on this sort of enterprise and have our own formulation without you involved is actually shortchanging both the patients and, frankly, you as responders. So if we hand you somebody who's potentially hot, even though they've had a course decon, that's, there's a potential problem with that. And there's a lot of issues that I think are going to be worked out. I've been authorized to extend an invitation to this group, anybody that would be involved with the SF-8 in the state of Texas to be part of the exercise, if, even if you don't want to participate, to simply observe. That certainly, that certainly is your purview. Um, we'll do, the, I'll make sure the dates go out. If you're interested, Stacy Masick at uh, Texas Task Force One would be your source of contact. And I would also share, just for, as a generality, on the email trail, we're no longer teeksmail.tamu.edu. It's now teeks.tamu.edu, just for what it's worth. That's the easiest lift. Um, this will involve really a combination of two things, this exercise. The contaminated environment, and it's odd also that the NFPA has formulated a committee 475, which is looking at the standards for first responders in contaminated hazardous materials and weapons of mass destru destruction environments. Um, they've now ventured into the idea of recommendations for organizing and operating. So if you're interested, please take a look at the new standards that have been kicked out. I think they're, they're somewhat informative. Um, we've got one other issue on this. Uh, stand by. Oh, the Institute of Medicine has a forum that addresses specifically public health and disaster or, or disaster medical, or they call it medical catastrophe issues. Um, they've got two enterprises this year. One is the restructuring of DMAT, which I'm sure would be of interesting to, interest to a lot of folks in the room. Um, there also is going to be a specific enterprise dedicated to international medical crises and their standards, uh, which is going to be somewhat challenging. So if, if there are interests in those types of things, we'd be happy to forward it along or, or kick it out through the STRAC channels. Um, and if there's any particular questions as far as what you're talking about, which is really infrastructure protection, obviously there, there's, there, uh, 2006 there were a couple of papers that were generated out of Johns Hopkins, uh, ethics papers, giving air cover to medical personnel saying, it's okay not to take care of all these other people. You can actually prioritize sanitation workers. You can prioritize people who work with water treatment plants. You can do this and that and the other thing. So there's a, there's a lot of established air cover for that. So we wouldn't be doing anything that would actually draw political disfavor if we were to start to talk about it. I think it's quite wise. Uh, the guys at Harvard with the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative, Lenny Marcus, Isaac Ashkenazi, who really is sort of the be all end all with the Israeli Defense Force, have already looked at how to harden a hospital. And, and what they do is they build it into the side of a mountain. They, they build their intensive care units into essentially a, a sort of a hemispheric shape inside the rock. 
um, that uses the geography to actually help protect. Now, you don't have the same sort of structure here in Texas, and not in all areas anyway. So I think there's a lot of lessons that will come from that, and that would probably be a good person to have if, if we can get him to come and speak to us, maybe. That's it for me, unless there's questions. It sounds like we're all moving to El Paso. Woohoo! We're going to build it into the side of the mountains there. Yeah, true. Okay, uh, I want to be kind to the time. So quickly, um, Kelly, can you talk about mass fatality for two minutes? Um, what? Oh, under, yeah, you're right. How would we do that? Under general comment, wait till the end. Good idea. Thank you, Reagan. We're a committee. We're not required to follow exactly, apparently. I'm for Jane. Okay. Um, can I, can I do some straw polls real quickly? Audience and committee members participate. So we are rocking and rolling along with this agenda with what I think are valid, credible, important issues. Now, I'm biased because I'm up here running it, but, but I, I think these are all topics that we were interested in and needed to be discussed. First of all, on the agenda, do you think the things we hit on today and the things we've been talking about were valid and needed to be discussed in this kind of a forum? Raise your hand. Okay. How, how many of you guys, how many people took the poll that Dudley sent out? Raise your hand if you took that poll that Dudley sent out. Okay, that's why I'm doing this now. Dudley Waite put out a poll on SurveyMonkey and he basically sent it to anybody he could think of. So clearly he didn't think of some of you guys. <laughs> Um, and that's why, I mean, there's only so many people you can think of, I guess. There is a movement at GTAC that will be discussed tomorrow. They will choose, apparently, one, or one of two options. They're changing GTAC. They're changing the meeting structure. Um, so the questions are, which one of those options uh, are they going to go with? How many people have seen the options? Raise your hand if you've seen the options. Okay. If I said you could choose for, well, this isn't the presidency. If you could pick A, B, or leave it like it is, that's the way we're going to vote. So you get, a, you get to leave it like it is. I'm just curious. Who votes the A option, the sort of 50-minute meeting? Why don't you stay with the R? The 50, that's the 50-minute meeting. The B option is the 90-minute meeting, but they stack on top of each other. Okay, a lot of A and B. Who would leave it like it is? Basically, this is working for you. Okay? So um, how many of you guys would have spoken if you'd had an opportunity with stakeholder opportunity at a microphone, would have come up and said you'd like to leave it as it is, that you, that's what you believe is working for you? Okay, so, so opportunity to talk would have been helpful before decisions were made. Is that valid? Okay. Um, I'll open it up for any comment about this. Anybody else, committee members, anybody else wants to? Um, Wanda? Eric, I think particularly for this meeting, I mean, we can barely get through an agenda at an hour and a half. So to cut it shorter, it would, it's just not fruitful. The strength of GTAC is the input from stakeholders. And anything we do to limit that, I think, will be a detractor from the good work that we do. I think there was much discussion about people willing to stretch the day, start earlier, go later, including having GTAC meet on Thursday evening and be here quite late um, so that we can get in and out. If we extend the days on Friday, then I personally will have to spend another night in San, I mean, sorry, not San Antonio, sorry, in Austin, because I won't be able to get a flight out. Southwest Airlines has refused to meet my schedule any longer, <laughs> and so those things are a problem. If we start at 8 o'clock in the morning, we're still going to have to come the night before, so I'm not, I'm not sure we are going to gain anything by changing the schedule, at least for all of the stakeholders. We may save a day in meeting space for dishes, but it's not going to save anybody that comes any money at all. In my opinion. I, I agree with everything you said. Leanne Vedrick with Nick Track in the Dallas Fort Worth area, or Fort Worth Dallas area, sorry. So I spoke earlier, so, but 
just to reiterate so we make sure that everybody's really hears what's going on. I mean, my frustration with this was that there were two options and neither one of them were acceptable. One of them limits stakeholder input by time and the other limits stakeholder input by attendance. And it was, you know, just ludicrous for those to be the only two options that came forward without any input from anybody. And so, you know, my vote would be to leave it like it is or, you know, because if we stretch early and late, we're still coming in the day before and leaving the day after. Why not leave things where they're at, where there's some flexibility for night meetings, uh, for these other things that are going on? It just it wasn't thought through, I don't think, on behalf of the big group. So, so to make sure that I don't seem completely obstructive, um, I, I'm actually not opposed to streamlining and making things more efficient. I'm, I'm not opposed to having thoughtful discussions about, uh, you know, a, a, a modified schedule. I don't think that one size fits all and that every single committee needs a 90 minute or two hour block. I, I think some of the, frankly, some of them don't need to meet because they don't meet but 10 minutes and they leave anyway. So I'll, I'll be glad to say that to the people who are running them. But, but I think it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm, as a longtime time GTACer, I'm frustrated with the way this was done. I don't like coming to meetings where basically we, there's, no in, there's no input for the stakeholder process. That is what GTAC is. GTAC is stakeholder process. GTAC is where we come together and coalesce around ideas where the best idea comes up through the sausage making and we walk out all feeling like we got what we need, maybe not what we wanted. That's the idea of consensus. Yes, it's messy. Yes, it is sometimes difficult. Well, just because something's difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You know, hard work, great things take hard work. That's why hardworking people tend to lean towards great things. And I, for one, want, I think GTAC has been wonderfully successful in Texas. It's built one of the best trauma systems in the nation. And we are squandering the stakeholder process with this. I'm going to say this exact sort of statement tomorrow at the, if there's allowed for any open comment from the stakeholders, then this is exactly what I'm going to say. Uh, many of you guys, the, the, the attendance is dwindling at GTAC. I'm going to tell you, I think that it's dwindling. It's going down. It's not going up. People blame that on the economy. People blame that on uh, other things, travel expenses. I, I think if this is important. People will come if it's important and if they feel like their voice is heard. Um, I would encourage each and every one of you committee members tomorrow at our GTAC meeting. I, I'd appreciate it if you would take the time to be there. GTAC is tomorrow. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. tomorrow night. I think we owe it to ourselves to be there. Um, and, you know, I'm a loud mouth, so I'm probably going to be loud. But, but you know, it, it, if you feel strongly about this as well in the audience, I'd appreciate it if you're there. I'm probably going to do one of my, you know, overdramatic moments and have everybody stand up or let out a, a whoop or something. So, so you're encouraged to be there if you care about this issue. If you don't care about it, don't show up. Fine with that. But I think we need to make sure it's clear to everybody involved that this matters to some of the committees. And I, for one, am very frustrated with the, I'm frustrated with the way it's been handled, and I'm frustrated with the decisions. And I don't want to be obstructive to the point where it has to stay the way it is. I'm fine with working, but that would be working together. That's what I would call that, working together. Committee chairs would be asked what would the committee chairs, Jory Klein and Dudley Waite and Eric Epley and other people who are involved and have led these committees for six and seven years might be consulted. I don't think that's a, never mind. Um, any other, anybody else have anything that I didn't have a little tantrum about? Okay. Open comment, uh, any other general discussion? I think we have a, item um, that Kelly was going to bring up. Thank you, Victor. And that is, that's how I, they are effective. <laughs>
great and Dr. Kidd, you know, I understood the targets of Asperger and PHP. You know, mass fatality is an ongoing problem and underprepared uh, in general across the state county judges will tell you that as well, everybody does. So <clears throat> we developed a draft kind of what we like to do is how can we increase preparedness through planning, training, and exercise for the local and regional public safety and healthcare system to respond to and manage all three components of mass fatality incidents, site board, and family assistance. So that's a lot. Uh, in short term, we're starting off with assessment. We're figuring out what resources have been purchased, uh, equipment wise, and what resources are out there that <coughs> have been uh, be identified as subject matter experts or talents that are available. So that's where we're starting first is figuring out what is available. Uh, those are both partially complete, as I reported at the TEMS on Friday. Two other steps have been taken. Uh, there's a survey in development for the emergency management coordinators around the state, and we're uh, putting that together. We have a draft of that. Uh, there's a survey of the plans that are going on by our friends at TDM. They're actually looking at multiple plans for multiple entities uh, to pick up on some themes and really completeness, anything that takes away from what just the state minimum is, if you will. In the long term, we can see where there may be an immediate response team uh, similar to, but not under the umbrella of the MTF, maybe a little more mistish in that model has been successful. Uh, and obviously, train and exercise do some more um, effort with that. Because there's a lot of resources. Uh, I, I was flipping through POs in preparation for this. I saw where Doug bought a bunch of body trays years ago. You know, but it's all over the state. So this would truly be back to the EMTF piece of one team um, across the state, resources coming together. Um, I know that the Panhandle bought a board trailer not long ago. So trying to get our arms around all those things bringing it together in short. Uh, it'll be a journey, but with uh, clear eyes, full hearts, can't fail, so we're gonna keep working on it, thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Mass fatality, if you guys have not seen some of the briefings, um, is uh, a real challenge, a resource challenge for any jurisdiction. And the number one problem you have with mass fatality is not picking up the parts. The number one problem you have, you can do the best forensic evidence, you can do all that stuff, and if you screw up the family assistance, if the people who are still alive are mad, you can have the best crime scene and it will fail. You will be seen as failing if we're not taking care of the family assistance part, and there are real, there's real expertise in our state that we need to be able to bring to bear for you very quickly. A um, couple of things on the EMPG thing, Maggie, if I could ask you on the EMP thing, can you... Uh, Please um, send Reagan links of credible uh, resources on the web that we could start. So the next discussion, we all walk in a little smarter about what electromagnetic um, pulse is. Is it real? Is it bad? What does it mean? And there are some real t 101 kind of tutorial things that are there that are helpful. So I meant to do that. Final thing. Uh, we need to thank, uh, so Reagan, make sure I do this well. We need to thank our um, offgoing, we have a few people who are uh, offgoing the committee and we have some new committee members as well. So um, let me walk through the people who are offgoing first and uh, thank them for their service. The first is Doug Havron. So Doug is here um, and I want to present Doug uh, with this letter and this uh, uh, plaque, uh, so thanking you for your service to the state and dedication to improving emergency health care in Texas to the Disaster Emergency Preparedness Committee. So uh, Chief Riley and I both thank you and the rest of the committee for your service. You. Similarly, I'm not going to read these each, but I am going to come thank you, uh, Frank Marshall, for your service. So Chief Riley and I appreciate that as well. Next on this is Dr. Minson. His term is up as well, and I appreciate his uh, dedication. He's provided a, a federal perspective and some of the national stuff, as well as the search and rescue, and his uh, uh, dedication has been incredibly uh, helpful to the committee as well. Dr. Minson.
And last but not least, but he's not here, is Dave Taylor. So uh, Dave Taylor served this committee for two different terms, and I appreciate the service. If any of you guys see Dave at the committee at the conference this week, tell him I got a document for him. I'll try to find him as well. You can get that. Thank you, Dudley. So uh, before we go, yep. Before we leave, I'd like an opportunity to um, give you all an example of an AMBUS deployment that um, happened in our area. Through our regional call center, um, our host agency received a call from AMR in New Mexico. You'll remember we sit way out in far west Texas. They had a, a plant occupational exposure and requested assistance with 25 individuals. Um, there was a little bit of 25, really? So shortly thereafter, we received a call that said, oops, it's 100. And so um, shortly after that, a call was received from the ESD fire chief asking if we could deploy the AMBUS. And then not too long after that, through AMR, we got a call from the New Mexico Department of Transportation, who, because they are all within our RAC, knew about the AMBUS. We responded, and it became clear that we probably were not going to have to transport individuals to hospitals. However, they did need to move all of those individuals to an assessment area three miles away. So they quickly um, moved all of the stretchers, et cetera, out of the AM bus, made it a seating um, bus, and they moved 78 individuals in three hours to that assessment site. So a great job to those people. But more, yes. <laughs> But I want to thank Dishes for that. Raul Guerrero is our regional EMS compliance officer. He is very involved with our AMBUS group. It would not have happened without his help. So thank you very much. Final uh, piece that I need to do is the uh, reappointment. So Brad Gowdy, Dr. Morbert, Dr. Nemeth, and Ricky Reeves, thank you guys for reapplying and for um, being willing to serve in your service in the past. Uh, and I'd like to announce the new members. I'm hoping and assuming they're here, but maybe they're not. So Gwen Campbell will serve until 2015. Hey, Gwen, excited to have you. Nick Sloan, we'll shout out to Nick, okay. So uh, Edwin Smith will fill out the remainder of a few terms. Uh, Micah Wilson as well. Micah, are you here? It's an AEL guy. So both those guys will start, um, all four of those people will start their terms in January officially, and the first meeting of this committee will be uh, February, right, whatever. Do we have the dates? Can we put the dates out? I know we should do that again, but have we picked dates for next year? 29, 28, 29 of February? And March 1. February 27, 28, and March 1st. 20, February 27, 28, March 1st. It's not a leap year. Okay, good. All right, any other public comment, Dudley? Real quick, um, a lot of you know I'm involved in a lot of different EMS organizations and got an email last Sunday talking about some of the issues that they're having in the Northeast and, and this is my personal opinion, doesn't reflect on anybody else. This is their Katrina. They are learning things that we learned in 2005. We were fortunate that our Katrina happened about a week and a half after the actual Katrina or fortunate or cursed, one or the other. But anyway, um, we've learned that and we've progressed greatly. Um, there, are, there are ambulance agencies up there that need help and they don't know how to get it. Um, they have resources on the ground that are sitting still not being used because people don't know how to do that. So at one point I think we all need to reach around and pat ourselves on the back. On the other side I think we need to be diligent in continuing to reach out. EMS involvement in disaster planning in this state is really, we're a little bit farther ahead but we're not that much farther ahead than anybody else. And in most places around this country, it's totally non-existent because of the fractured nature of EMS agencies and the EMS industry. We are rarely, if ever, well represented in the emergency management planning structure and the actual pulling off of the, of the event. And so the work of the EMTF groups, the work of this group, the work of TDEM and reaching out to those EMS agencies, as tiring as it is and as hard as it is and how many times you have to go back again and again until they get that MOA signed and, and you get them involved and when you go to say, hey, we need you in an exercise and they say, who's paying for that because I can't afford to send three ambulances with overtime to that event. Keep pushing. We're miles ahead of everybody else. It, it, realistically, we are because, of, because we have been cursed since 2005. 
Um, it, and all you have to do is, gonna, is in a few months is start reading some after actions and you're going to realize how much better we are. But we could start sliding back quickly if we don't keep the pressure up. So as frustrating as it is, we're all fighting the fight, but keep pushing those agencies to get involved, to practice, and to be ready for game day. So I appreciate that, Dudley. I think it's a, it's a good thing for us to consider. I think we need to be prepared and willing uh, to reach out and assist our partners in the spring. If that comes up, we have the opportunity to, to offer some of the, you know, the Amlet Staging Manager class, MIST, some of the other concepts. We need to be prepared and willing to be envoys, to be ambassadors of lessons learned that we've learned that may be effective. Um, second of all, don't go throwing rocks from glass houses. Okay? Never forget, you're one stumble away from being flat on your face. And we've been flat on our face and it stings. I had a conversation with somebody who was talking about how ridiculous it was that they had the gas problems they had, or still having. I, I enlightened that person. This is why I think these kinds of meetings are helpful. These meetings right here give us all perspective. How many people drive their car every single day to work? Raise your hand. Huh. How many people do you think that work in New York City drive their car even once a week. <laughs> the people in the Northeast use mass transit because it's effective and they don't use their cars. They're not Texans. So when the mass transit was out and the city opened back up and they started using their cars, that increased their demand. If the, if the distribution system had been set and working perfectly they suddenly had three to five times as many people filling up their cars as they ever had seen in their life. Oh, and the distribution system was broken. So, so please always remember, you know, I think they had problems. I think they have, this was their Katrina. I think they will learn from them. But in a lot of ways, they have issues we don't have. And we should always be mindful and respectful of people who are dedicated to emergency management and to health care, just like we are. Um, and we want to be respectful and helpful to those partners and not uh, overly critical. I've seen some articles that I'm a little frustrated with, frankly. And it's a, usually it's people who aren't even in a house anymore. They're throwing rocks going, well, I'm an expert. It's like, really? Where, where do you work? You have any risk? Oh, you're a you're a consultant. I get it. Okay. Texas gas stations and ATMs don't have generators either. Yeah, Texas gas stations and ATMs don't have generators either. Good point. Some of the gener some of the gas stations now do have to read it, but you're right. Okay. Um, I did the meeting thing, Reagan. Anything else I'm forgetting? Any other public comment? Going once. Going twice. Okay. We'll see you guys in February. Thank you.